Hi there, and welcome to this lesson on Pure Mathematics 3. And in this lesson, we're looking at what's called the chain rule. Now, we have mentioned the chain rule in previous lessons, but in this lesson, we're going to look at it quite thoroughly. What is the chain rule? Well, the chain rule enables you to differentiate what's called a function of a function. What's a function of a function? Well, it's something like e to the power of sine x. We well, have one function, e, and then you put another function, sine x, into it. Or the other way around, if you had something like the cosine of e to the 5x. If you're working it out on the calculator, you'd work out e to the power of 5x first of all, and then put that into the function cosine. Something like the tangent of 3x to the 4 plus 7x. 3x to the 4 plus 7x is a function in its own right, and you'd work out that function and put it into tangent. Or something like e to the power of the cosine of 4x cubed is actually a function of a function of a function. So the inside function would be 4x cubed. That's what you'd work out first if you were doing it on your calculator. That answer you'd put into cosine. And then the answer to that function you'd put into the exponential function e. In terms of how we differentiate a function of a function, there are two ways of thinking about it. And we'll look at both of them. First of all, in function language, if y is equal to a function of a second function, g of x, then dy by dx is equal to the differential of the outside function, so f dashed of g of x, multiplied by the differential of the inside function, g dashed of x. Or in Leibniz notation, um, what we would say is y is equal to a function of u, and then that u itself is a function of x, g of x. And writing it down like that gives us dy by dx is equal to dy by du, which is essentially differentiating the outside function, and then multiplying that by du by dx, which is differentiating the inside function. It's quite easy to remember that formula, because whilst these things are not fractions, if you think of them as like fractions, then you'd see the two du's canceling each other and getting dy by dx. Now, it's not that you can do that, but that's a useful way just to help you to remember the formula. We'll go through a couple of examples, and the first two examples, I will use both methods. So, first of all, we'll use the function method, where you differentiate the outside function first, and then multiply that by the differential of the inside function. So, we'll differentiate sine first, and then multiply that by the differential of the inside function, 4x cubed. But I'll let you have a go yourself first. So pause the video, have a go, and then come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look. So dy by dx, first of all, we differentiate the sine, and when we differentiate sine, we get cosine. We need to keep the 4x cubed, but we don't do anything with it. And then we differentiate the inside function, so we differentiate the 4x cubed and get 12x squared in the normal way. And that's it done. That would be the answer. All we need to do is tidy that up, which would give us that. Okay, doing the same question, but using Leibniz notation, we'd need to write y as a function of u and then say what u is as a function of x. This method is slightly harder. It's slightly more complicated and confusing. But have a go, pause the video, and come back to me when you're ready. Okay, so first of all, we need to write it down in this form, which means we'll say that y is equal to the sine of u, where u itself is a function, u is equal to 4x cubed. Now, once you've written it like that, you just find these two things in the normal way. You differentiate y with respect to u, you differentiate u with respect to x, and multiply those two answers together. dy by du is just the cosine of u du by dx is 12x squared. Then we need to multiply those two things together, which will give us cosine u times by 12x squared. Now, the last thing we need to do is remember that we introduced a substitution, which was u equals 4x cubed. Whenever you introduce a substitution into a question, you have to undo it at the end of the question. So instead of writing u, we need to write 4x cubed here. And that will give us the cosine of 4x cubed times by 12x squared, which again tidies up to give us the same answer as before. Okay, example two. 
First of all, using function language, the outside function is the power of four, and we'll differentiate that in the normal way, times it by four, and the power going down by one, and then differentiating the inside function, which is the inside of the brackets. Okay, have a go, pause the video, and come back to me when you're ready. Okay, as we said, first of all, we need to differentiate the power of four on the outside of the brackets. And that will give us four into five x squared plus two x cubed, cubed. Then we need to multiply that by the differential of the inside function, which gives us 10 x plus six x squared. And that is the answer. All we need to do is tidy that up a little, which will give us that. Okay, we'll have a go at doing the same thing using Leibniz notation where you'd write y as a function of u, and then say u itself is a function of x. Have a go, pause the video, come back to me when you're ready. Okay, so the first thing that we would do is say, well, y is equal to u to the power of four, where u itself is a function of x, five x squared plus two x cubed. Then we work out these two things, divide by du, we do in the normal way, that's four u cubed, du by dx, we're doing the normal way. That's 10x plus 6x squared. Then we need to multiply those two things together to get dy by dx, which gives us that. Then we need to undo the substitution. So u is equal to 5x squared plus 2x cubed. So we need to substitute that in for u, which will give us this. And then finally, tidying that up gives us the same answer as before. Okay, example three. This one has a square root in it. The significant thing here is that rather than writing square root, this question becomes a lot easier if you choose to write the square root as a power of a half outside the brackets. Then use the normal method. Once you've done that, find dy dx at the point where x is 2 and y is 4. Have a go, pause the video, come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look. Now, as we said, the first thing to do to make this an awful lot easier is just to change the notation. So square root is the same thing as a power of a half. Then we differentiate it in the normal way. So we times by a half, and the power of a half will go down by one to minus a half. And then differentiating the inside function, we'll get times by six x plus two. That is the differentiation done. All we need to do now is tidy that up, which gives us six x plus two, divided by two into the square root of three x squared plus two x. We had to find dy by dx at this point, which is the point where x equals two. So we substitute x equals two into this, and that'll give us 12 plus two over two times the square root of 12 plus four, which simplifies to that. The square root of 16 is four, so that'll give us 14 over two times four. Halving the top and the bottom gives us dy by dx equals seven over four. Example four, similar idea, and you have a similar issue as with the square root. This question becomes a lot easier if instead of writing sine cubed 4x, you choose to write that as the sine of 4x all cubed, which means exactly the same thing. So have a go yourself, pause the video, and then come back to me when you're ready. Okay, you don't have to do this, but as we said, it makes things look a little bit easier if you use the alternative notation for sine cubed, which is that you've got the sine of 4x all cubed with the cubed outside the brackets. Then the differentiation is much more familiar. We times by three and the power of three goes down by one to two. And that gives us three times by the sine of 4x squared. Then we've got to differentiate the sine. Now, when we differentiate sine, we'll get cosine. So the cosine of 4x. And this time there's a third function. So this time we have 4x on the inside and we need to differentiate that too. And when we differentiate 4x, we'll just get four. So this question is actually a function of a function of a function. Differentiating the outside function three gives us that. Differentiating the sine gives us that. Differentiating the 4x gives us that. And tidying it all up, gives us 12 sine squared 4x times by the cosine of 4x. Now there is a special case of the chain rule, which is that one divided by dy by dx is equal to dx by dy. Now 
Now, it's important to remember this. So 1 over the differential of y with respect to x is exactly the same thing as the differential of x with respect to y. Now, if these were fractions, that would obviously be true. They're not fractions. They're differentials. But that is true. The proof is a little bit tricky. It's a bit confusing. And you won't find it in most textbooks. But I will go through it with you. Don't worry too much about it. You don't need to understand it. And it won't turn up in the exam. But I'll go through it with you anyway. You start off by letting y equal f of x. And then you take the inverse function of both sides. So the inverse function of the left-hand side would be that. And the inverse function of the right-hand side would be that. The reason for doing that is these two things then cancel with each other. You've got the inverse function and the function. So the right-hand side just becomes x. The next thing you do is differentiate both sides with respect to x. Now, differentiating the left-hand side with respect to x would be written like that. Differentiating x with respect to x just gives you 1. The next thing is using the chain rule. And we use the chain rule on the left-hand side. So we rewrite this as the differential of the inverse function of y with respect to y times by dy by dx. And you can see how the two dy's would cancel if you were allowed to do that. And then you would have the same thing as we have up here. The next thing to do is move the dy by dx to the other side. So you get 1 divided by dy by dx. And then the final thing is noticing here we've got the inverse function of y. Well, the inverse function of y is just equal to x. So instead of writing the inverse function of y here, we just write x instead. And that gives us dx by dy is 1 over dy by dx. And that's what we were trying to prove. OK, one example where using that is the easiest way to do the question. If you had to find the value of the gradient to the curve yq plus 2y equals x at the point 3, 1. Now, on this question, it's a lot easier to find dx by dy than it is to find dy by dx. So that's what you do. You find dx by dy, and then you say dy by dx is 1 over that, and move on from there. I'll let you have a go. Pause the video and come back to me when you're ready. OK, so just swapping sides, writing x as a function of y, you'd have x is equal to yq plus 2y. And then we'll differentiate both sides with respect to y. So dx by dy would be equal to 3y squared plus 2 when we differentiate with respect to y. And then we'll say dy by dx is 1 over that. It's 1 over dx by dy. So that will give us 1 over 3y squared plus 2. We were asked to find dy by dx at the point 3, 1, which is at the point where x is 3 and y is 1. So we need to substitute y equals 1 into here, which will give us 1 over 3 plus 2, which means that the gradient of the curve at the point 3, 1 will equal 1 fifth. OK, that gets us to the end of this lesson. If you've got the textbook, then turn to page 130 and have a go at exercise 6C. Thank you very much for listening and cheerio.